Hello everybody and welcome to Getting APIs to Work. In today's video, we'll look at API archaeology. What do I mean by this? I mean by this that I talk to a lot of people who say, we don't do APIs, tell us something about APIs. And very often I have to tell them, no, 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 you do APIs. You may not call them that, but you are doing things to connect applications. So in the end, you are doing some, some kind of API. And I think it's interesting to think about how that actually can help you to get started with APIs, to smoothly transition into APIs. And because I mentioned that idea of API archaeology so often, I thought it would be useful to create a video just for that. This presentation was originally given at API Days Paris 2020. So thanks a lot for the opportunity to speak there. And here's the video following up to that talk. What I want to do today is pretty simple. I want to walk you through this idea of API archaeology and what it means. And we'll do two very simple things. We'll talk about proto-APIs. These are the things that technically aren't APIs, but they are in spirit in the sense that that is an attempt to get data from one application to another. So in, in a way, it's an API. And after we've done that, looking at proto-APIs and what that means, we'll look at how that translates into getting started with your API journey and what to look out for. So let's jump into it. In a sense, you could say that APIs have been around forever. It's really the attempt of having different parts of a computer system or of a computer landscape talk to each other. Originally, API was a term that was only used for communications within one computer. And that morphed to the term how most people use it today, which is to mean kind of anything where two applications are talking to one another, which nowadays in most cases is actually across a network and not just within one computer. But again, that really, that really doesn't matter that much. It's just two applications exchanging information. And when you look about what APIs are doing, the, the main idea of APIs really is to have two applications to talk to each other without necessarily having some, something in the middle other than a communication channel. And that is different, fundamentally different, from some of the approaches that, for example, in enterprise architecture exist, where you have relatively sophisticated infrastructure somewhere in the middle that's doing all kinds of things which initially looked like a good idea. And I think nowadays people more and more realize that maybe not so much, but it's something that is continually evolving, but it's definitely interesting to think about this difference between two parties just exchanging information or two parties exchanging information with one essential component in the middle without which nothing works. I think that's one of the important messages of API is that having this direct communication through a relatively simple channel has many advantages to it. Of course, also has disadvantages, but it's an interesting thought. So when you think about APIs, then you start realizing that, yeah, applications had to exchange data for a very long time because you want to get data or information from point A to point B. How do you do that? Let's look at three patterns, how that happened before APIs, how we call them today had been around. Number one is file transfer. File transfer is this idea of transferring files between machines or having them on one machine and pointing one application that is writing the file to the file and then another application that is reading the file, which results in some kind of information exchange between those applications. So you can think of that already as a API. It's in my list of proto-APIs because it's not really 
an interface in the strict sense of the word, but that doesn't really matter. And I see that this is something that is still used a lot in large organizations because they have applications that can't do something better than file exchange and there can be machinery around it. So for example, we have a whole suite of products just managing file transfers and a lot of organizations still need that. And sometimes it's good enough, but it also has disadvantages of course. One of the very obvious ones is that it usually incurs a long delay between information going from one application to the other. And it also can be kind of tedious to move these files around to figure out which one is updated, which one you already have processed and all these kind of things. Again, there is file management around that that helps you to manage that, but it is kind of a old school way of doing things. Let's move forward in history a little bit. The next one that you can think about is data integration. Data integration is one step forward from file transfer in the sense that it's a more managed way of doing that and it's not necessarily files. Sometimes it means you extract data from a database and then you somehow massage it into whatever is needed and then you add it to another database. And these databases are you could say kind of the, like the files for applications, right? That's where the parallel is, but it's, it's a little bit more sophisticated because there are components in the middle that do these transformation operations, which take the data and then put it into the form that is needed in the application. This has the advantage that it's a little bit, let's say, um, tedious than file transfer because you can kind of do it alongside the application itself when you insert data into a database but it also can be very tricky because then the question is how does the application realize there's new data are there any synchronization issues that arise and so forth so this also is a way to exchange data between applications but it does also have these disadvantages of having to manage these databases magically changing underneath the applications. Let's move one step forward. Data integration was the one that we looked at. Now the next step that we have is application integration. And this is the pattern that I've mentioned already where in many cases you have these machineries, often they're called enterprise service bus or they have another name rather sophisticated machinery that integrates applications, meaning that it is something where this application integration infrastructure makes sure that applications can attach to it and then it makes sure that it gets information from one application and puts it to the other and so forth. And depending on how these adapters into this application integration infrastructure work, this can be more synchronous, more real time than the previous attempts that we looked at, then file transfer and data integration. So application integration actually isn't so bad, but the one big disadvantage that you have here is that there is a lot of centralization involved. Oftentimes this ESB, this centralized component becomes a real bottleneck in organizations because everything depends on this thing being updated, being managed, being performant and so forth. And when that component doesn't work, then everything fails. And also everybody who wants to change anything needs to go through whatever process is required to add new logic to this component. So we've seen over the last, I would say, two decades that this pattern of how to organize large IT systems also is a little bit, um, I would say, trending down because it is not really very well equipped to keep up with the growing complexity of today's IT landscape, also with the growing demands of how quickly you can change things. And this means that even though this is not so, not such a bad thing to do, it doesn't really fit well the 
requirements of today's world, which often are around scale and speed. But when you do any of those things, and that is my thing, then you are really using APIs. You are not using APIs technically, but you are connecting applications. You make data flow between these applications in some shape or form. And that is an important thing that you can realize. And in some regard, you could just say, I'm doing APIs. I'm just not technically using API technologies. But doing these things that we just looked at already gives you a very good starting point to think about, okay, somebody connected these components at some cost. So apparently there was value in connecting those. Now let's see, does it create any problems? If so, maybe we can remove those problems by moving this interaction between the components to APIs. If it doesn't create any problems, frankly, you can just leave it as it is for now and just kind of keep an eye on it and say, okay, these components are communicating in, in a way that maybe you would do differently today, but until we run into problems, we just keep doing it that way. So in the end, I think the important thing here really is to understand that if you take inventory of what you're already doing to make applications talk to each other, you kind of have a good starting point to think about where you have APIs, proto APIs, and you have a good starting point to think about where should I invest first? Where do I get most value if I start actually turning those proto APIs into APIs? And one of the biggest value po points of doing that actually can be that if you turn it into an API, suddenly this connection that was designed to make two applications talk becomes this connection that makes one application make available its capabilities and then many others can talk to it through that API. Meaning that if that is valuable information that before was kind of locked into that one component, if you turn it into an API, you unlock it and you make it available to other consumers. And that often is the main value to look for thinking through where you might want to invest in your IT landscape. Now, assume that you want to start your API journey. You have identified some of those interaction points that exist that are proto APIs and you want to turn them into APIs. How do you go about it? My recommendation always is start small. Don't treat this as another huge project where you say, oh, we move from non-APIs to APIs and we'll do that in one big bang. That would be, I think, a, a very risky and not a very great idea. Instead, start small, identify valuable points where you would say this information available in that component has been locked so far. If we unlock it, we unlock potential. And here is some potential that we think can really create value. And then you do create an API for this one thing. And that allows you to learn. It allows you to realize what kind of challenges you run into, what kind of infrastructure maybe you want, what kind of governance you need, all these things that will become an issue once you start scaling up your API journey. What typically becomes a challenge at some point is that your mentality also needs to change from building the system of integrated component to cultivating an ecosystem of these APIs that get exposed and consumed and seeing this as a more loosely coupled and more dynamic or, and organic, I would say, structure of components that always evolve. You will never be finished with that. And given how quickly things change these days, it's something that is exactly what you want. It's this ability to change things quickly. So my advice here would be start small, start building up practices in a community and that allows you to gain experience and to start moving from the proto API world into the proper API world. And in order to make sure that what you do 
can adapt to lessons you learn or to changing constraints that you get from your organization, from the environment. Always design for change. That's one of the really important parts to keep in mind. Proto-API approaches often are these one-time projects. We have to connect these two things. Once we have connected them, we declare victory and we never touch it again. With APIs, the mindset is really different. The mindset is, I make a capability available, I see who's interested in it, I assume that creates value, and if somebody tells you, if you change it that way, it would create even more value, then you should be able to do that. And you should be able to do that without disrupting existing consumers. And that's a little bit of the challenge of APIs, that the, it's, it's a more dynamic environment that you will encounter, and one important aspect to manage that diversity and that dynamic is that you have to design for change. And that means that every API that you design is designed with the mindset of, I might have to change it later. I should design it in a way that, so that I can design it with the fewest disruptions. And there is a whole series around these things that I, I published uh, lately around how to design for change and these kind of things. So you might be interested in looking at that, but it really is this idea that designing for change is one of the core things that you always have to keep in mind in your API practice and on your API journey. And the idea there is to make sure that the dynamic of a large organization that's constantly adapting to different market forces and different environments and different business goals that you have, that this dynamic of organizations is directly reflected in the dynamic of those APIs. So what you want to build is something that needs to be able to change and needs to be easy to change. And I think that is really one of the important takeaways here. So, design for change and cultivate the landscape by saying we have this growing landscape of APIs that are available for consumption. If somebody, something needs to be built on top of that, that's great. That exa that's exactly why it exists. And that may also mean that we change parts of it. So it's something where you really have to change your mindset from building that system and integrating it and declaring victory when everything runs in that box, but instead saying, I have this landscape of consumers, this landscape of capabilities that are available, and that's what is valuable for my organization, and that's what everybody contributes to, what everybody builds on, and that is the trajectory that we're on. And the reason why you want to do that is that nowadays you have a lot of scenarios where you start really down this path of building a platform. Building a platform means that on the one hand, you want to expose more and more capabilities. What we see here, the arrow number one, you want to expose more and more capabilities and you, make, you want to make assets available that you have within your organization, meaning that you create APIs for them. You do that because you also want others to co-create value with you. You want your business partners to be able to access certain services, access certain assets, so that they can do something and they can create value and you can participate in that value creation process. And you do that because you want to deliver value to your customers, to your end users. So arrow number two here is this ability to say, we want to build on this growing set of capabilities in our platform to deliver value to our consumers, to our customers. And arrow number three tells you there are more and more cases where it's not just you doing that, it's you doing that in conjunction with strategic partners where you have certain models of how they get something out of it, how you get something out of it, how your consumers get something out of it. And that's really where the magic starts, that you start building this platform and this ecosystem of interconnected and value exchanging components and partners. So if we summarize what drives you to, let's look at what really drives you to add APIs. Number one, you want to open up what you have. 
So that's the fundamental role of API, unlocking value that before has been locked in structures that were much harder to access and APIs allow you to open it up. Number two is that these APIs also will allow you to easier build new value chains to your consumers. So you can, in, in, in uh, marketing parlance, right? these are multi-channel strategies where you say, whatever we build, we should have multiple channels on top of it or the ability to build multiple channels on top of this. And number three, the factor is this ability to interact with partners on a strategic level. And that becomes more and more important. The platform as a business model, not just as an IT thing. And that is really the main thrust, I think, that you see in, in solid platform strategies nowadays is that they, are, they have a sharp focus on a platform, not just as an IT thing, but on platforms as a business model. When you do this, the one thing to keep in mind, and I'm showing you this, I'm, I, I'm, I'm linking this from my slide, I'll also link it from the video description. This is just one example of many. This is, this is from a study from McKinsey, where they look at where API initiatives or digital transformation initiatives stall. And what you can learn from this, and from, like I said, many other studies you'll find, is that the challenge is not so much to start, Digitalization is not that hard to understand, to get started. What's hard is to scale it. And scaling doesn't only mean having more of it. Scaling also means being better at changing it all the time. Not just do more transformation and then you're done and say, oh, we're transformed. The challenge of transformation always is that it is a never ending process. And that is where a lot of organizations today have trouble because it's different from what they used to. But I think when you keep that in mind from the very beginning, that you're entering a new reality where things will start changing constantly and that's what you're designing for. I think when you have that in your mind, then it becomes much easier to come up with a good strategy and make sure that you keep your eyes on those things that really matter, such as this thing where I talked about designing for change. I think that's, for example, one of the things that should be absolutely key in, in a lot of those strategies. So let's wrap up. I think whenever somebody tells me we're not yet doing APIs, I think that is a mindset that ideally people should change and say, no, no, we're doing APIs, we're just doing them in a bad way. We're doing file transfer, we're doing data integration, we're doing application integration. These are all APIs, they're just not good APIs. So think about it as not doing something totally different. Think about it as something that is a better way of doing what you're doing right now and that will allow you to improve on a variety of fronts. In order to do that, make sure that you start small, you figure out where you can expose value as quickly as possible so that you start with good candidates so that people will see that you actually create value and get energized and enthusiastic to join the effort. Don't treat this as another waterfall thing where you think for a long time about what should we do about APIs. Instead, get started. Get started, start with building APIs and then you'll learn. You'll learn by doing. It really works that way, trust me. I've seen it many times. It doesn't work as a waterfall. It learn, works with learn by doing. Iterate, improve things over time and then I think that will really work well for you. Design for change, always keep in mind that you're never done. You will always have to tweak things. So always keep that in mind and also make sure that everybody is on board with that and that people understand what's happening, why it's happening, what the advantages are and how it helps them to deliver more value to your organization and to the customers in the end. With that, I'm done. Thanks very much for listening. The slides are available at the URI that I'm showing here. I'll also link it from the description. 
If you have any feedback, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, please leave a comment. I'm always really interested to hear from people what they think about it, what else they might want to hear about. And if you find more information about myself, there here's some information about uh, my Twitter, YouTube and LinkedIn feed. So thanks a lot for watching. I hope you found that interesting. I hope this idea of API archaeology, of proto APIs and of proper APIs was something that inspired you a little bit and will help you on your API journey. See you soon. Bye bye.